I'd been planning this vacation for months. A solitary retreat to the peaceful solitude of a coastal town in Maine. A chance to get away from the hustle and bustle of New York City, to reset and recharge. The quaint bed and breakfast I'd booked was a charming old Victorian home, nestled on a quiet street overlooking the rocky coastline. The first two days were a blissful haze of leisurely strolls along the beach, reading on the wraparound porch, and enjoying the fresh seafood at the local tavern. The town was small, friendly, the kind of place where everyone knew everyone else. It was a welcome change from the anonymity of city life, but it also meant that the arrival of an outsider like myself didn't go unnoticed. On the third day, I noticed something odd. The locals seemed to watch me with a wary curiosity. Whispers followed me as I walked down the main street. The friendly smiles were replaced with tight-lipped nods, their eyes darting away when I attempted to meet their gaze. It was unnerving, but I brushed it off. Then one evening as I was returning to the B&B, I saw her. A woman standing at the edge of the cliff, her long white dress billowing in the wind. She was staring out to sea, her figure illuminated by the ghostly glow of the moon. I called out to her, but she didn't respond. I was about to approach her when a hand clamped down on my shoulder. Leave her be, a graveled voice warned. I turned to see one of the locals, an old man with a weathered face and a sea salt in his beard. She ain't for the likes of you. I asked him who she was, but he just shook his head and shuffled away, leaving me standing in the cold, the woman's ethereal figure still haunting the cliff's edge. That night I dreamt of the woman. She was calling to me, her voice as soft as the sea breeze, beckoning me to join her. I woke up with a jolt, my room bathed in the pale glow of the moonlight. The house was eerily silent, the only sound the rhythmic pounding of the waves against the shore. I found myself drawn to the window, to the cliff where the woman had stood. But she was no longer there. In her place was a single white lily, its petals glistening in the moonlight. A shiver ran through me, not of cold, but of something else. Fear? Anticipation? I couldn't tell. Over the next few days, I became obsessed with the woman. I asked the locals about her. Their responses were vague, filled with half-truths and folklore. Some said she was a ghost, doomed to wander the cliffs for eternity. Others claimed she was a witch, luring men to their deaths. I didn't know what to believe. I started to see her everywhere in the reflection of the tavern's window, in the shadows of the alleyways, in the crashing waves of the sea. Every night I dreamt of her. Her voice, her eyes, her plea for me to join her. The final night of my vacation arrived. I lay in bed, my heart pounding in my chest. Sleep eluded me. The moon was full, its light casting an ethereal glow over the town. I rose from my bed, drawn by an inexplicable force. I walked the path to the cliff, the woman's voice echoing in my ears. There she was, standing at the edge, her white dress glowing in the moonlight. She turned to me, her eyes a deep, endless blue. Join me, she whispered, her voice carrying on the wind. I stepped closer, drawn in by her siren song. Suddenly the ground beneath me gave way. I fell, the sea rushing up to greet me. Her laughter echoed in my ears as the darkness enveloped me. The last thing I saw was her face, a cruel smile playing on her lips. I woke up in a hospital bed, a nurse telling me I'd been found on the beach, half drowned. The doctors chalked it up to sleepwalking, an unfortunate accident. But I knew the truth. As I left the coastal town of Maine, I couldn't help but glance back at the cliff. Was she real? Or was she just a figment of my imagination, a result of the isolation and the whisperings of the locals? Regardless, the memory of her haunted my dreams. The beautiful woman on the cliff, with her endless blue eyes and her cruel, cruel smile. My vacation may have ended, but the horror had followed me home. I needed it. The break, the escape, the solitude. The city was choking me, the cacophony of sirens, the bustle of people, the relentless grind of work. I needed to get away. So I booked a cabin, away from all of it, nestled in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. A week of peace and quiet, a week of solitude. That was the plan. The drive was long, the roads winding and treacherous. As I drove deeper into the wilderness, the city's noise was replaced by the chirping of crickets, the rustle of leaves, and the distant hooting of owls. The air was crisp and fresh, the moon casting long shadows as it illuminated the dense forest. 
I arrived at the cabin, an old wooden structure standing in defiance of time, its windows reflecting the moonlight. My first day there was bliss. I spent it hiking, the forest around me alive with the sounds of nature. The evening was serene, the cabin warm and inviting, the crackling fireplace a comforting presence. But the peace didn't last. On the second night I heard it, a distant guttural howl. An animal, I thought, trying to calm my racing heart, but it was unlike any sound I'd heard before. The howl echoed a haunting melody that sent chills down my spine. I tried to shrug it off, to convince myself it was just the wilderness playing tricks on me. But the next day, I found tracks. Large, unidentifiable tracks circling the cabin. My heart pounded in my chest, a sense of unease creeping in. The howls grew louder each night, closer. I could hear the rustling of leaves, the snapping of twigs. Each sound seemed magnified in the stillness of the night. A symphony of terror that left me sleepless. The once comforting cabin now felt like a trap, the walls closing in on me. I decided to leave, but I wasn't quick enough. As I packed my bags, the growls grew louder, more aggressive. The cabin shook, the windows rattling, the wooden structure groaning under the force. Something was trying to get in. I could hear the scraping of claws against the door, the relentless pounding. Terrified, I barricaded myself in the room, my heart pounding against my ribcage. The growling was deafening, the scratching persistent. Hours passed, each minute an eternity as I waited, waited for the inevitable. And then it stopped. The growling ceased, the scratching stopped. The silence was deafening. I waited, hardly daring to breathe. But nothing happened. And the night passed, the sun finally rising, casting its warm rays through the cracks in the blinds. I left the cabin, my heart still pounding, my nerves on edge. The forest was quiet, the air still. As I got into my car, I glanced back at the cabin, and there it was. A large, hulking creature standing on the porch, its eyes glowing, a low growl escaping its throat. It watched me, its gaze never wavering as I drove away, the cabin disappearing in the rearview mirror. The city welcomed me back with its noise and bustle, the sirens a comforting sound. The mountains were a memory, a nightmare that had passed. But every night as I lay in bed, I hear it. The howl, the growling, a haunting melody that reminds me of the terror I left behind in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. I'd been looking forward to my vacation in the isolated cabin by the lake for months. Just me the gentle lapping of the water and the chance to finish the novel I'd been working on for years. No distractions, no interruptions, just peace and quiet. The cabin was cozy, nestled in the woods with a stunning view of the lake. The scent of pine trees lingered in the air mixed with the crispness of the open water. In the afternoons I would sit on the porch with my laptop, letting my fingers dance across the keys as the sun dappled through the canopy of trees. The tranquility, however, didn't last. It started with the whispers, soft, almost imperceptible whispers that seemed to echo from the lake. I shrugged it off, thinking it was just the wind rustling through the branches or the water lapping against the shore. I was alone after all, but the whispers grew louder, more insistent. They sounded human, but I couldn't make out any words. Then the footprints appeared. One morning, I woke up to find a set of damp footprints leading from the lake to my cabin. I followed them heart pounding until they disappeared at the edge of the water. I was baffled, terrified. I hadn't heard any trespassers during the night, and I was miles away from the nearest neighbor. The whispers turned into voices, agonizing cries for help, screams that pierced the silence of the night. I found myself unable to sleep, the eerie sounds echoing in my ears. My writing suffered, the once peaceful cabin felt oppressive, the solitude suffocating. One night, as the screams reached a fever pitch, I decided to investigate. I grabbed my flashlight and my courage, venturing out into the darkness. The cries seemed to be coming from the lake. As I approached, my flashlight illuminated something floating in the water. It looked like a body. Panicked, I ran back to the cabin and called the police. They arrived quickly, their flashing lights slicing through the darkness. They found the body, a young woman, her eyes wide open in terror. Her clothes were old, from a different era. I stood on the porch wrapped in a blanket watching in horror as they pulled her from the water. The officers questioned me, their suspicion palpable. Who was I? 
What was I doing here all alone? But I had no answers. I was just as confused, just as frightened. The local news reported the incident. The woman they said had gone missing decades ago. She had been vacationing at the lake, staying in the very cabin I was now occupying. She had vanished without a trace, her disappearance sending shockwaves through the small town. The police investigation turned up nothing. They couldn't explain the voices, the footprints, or the sudden appearance of the body. They left, leaving me alone once again in the cabin. The voices have stopped now. The lake is silent again. But I can still feel her presence. Still see her wide-eyed stare reflected in the moonlit water. I can't write anymore. The words won't come. I don't know what happened at this cabin, why her spirit seemed to reach out to me. All I know is that this vacation, this retreat I had looked forward to, has turned into a chilling nightmare. A nightmare I can't wake up from. My bags are packed. I'm leaving in the morning. I need to escape this place, escape the haunting memories that now linger. I thought I was seeking solitude, but what I found was a terrifying mystery wrapped in whispers and shadows. This was supposed to be a peaceful getaway, but it turned out to be the scariest vacation I've ever experienced. I'll never forget the woman of the lake, her desperate cries, her cold, lifeless eyes. I'll never forget this cabin, the isolation, the fear. I thought I was alone, but I was wrong, so very wrong. And so, dear viewers, we have reached the end of our journey. Three tales of summer spooks, each more chilling than the last. It's a stark reminder that even in the warmth of the sun, the cold touch of fear can still find us. Remember, these stories serve as a warning to always be vigilant, for horror doesn't take a vacation.